I just did a shot glass of this maple syrup, man. It's like, it's like butter, but better. It's, it goes down so smooth. And like on the taste, there's that, a, the tiniest hint of wood smoke taste in this maple syrup. Oh my God. <sighs> this is a show about jewelry. Why we wear it, why it matters, how it's made, and what it means. I'm Alex D, and I turn cannabis into gold. I make mind-blowing jewelry in gold, silver, and platinum from cannabis plants here in Canada for stage, screen, for people who want to rock crazy jewelry. I'm the Cannabis Goldsmith. So it's almost spring here now in, in Ontario, Canada. And this weekend, it's hot syrup weekend. It's maple weekend, maple syrup weekend in the province that I live in and Ontario. And the area of the province I live in is ground zero for maple, maple syrup production. So the Americans will tell you, the American listeners... I'm not insulting you, but I'm just saying we make a better maple syrup up here than you do in your upper eastern states because we're more northern. And just like ice wine, the the colder the colder it is, the better it is for the product. I'm just saying. But anyway, let's not get into the um, political stuff. This is a show about jewelry. So, But anyway, for the first part of the show, I'm going to be talking about what I did yesterday because I am still, I am still hyped. Whether it's because of the sugar um, or not, uh, it, I I don't know. But anyway, yesterday I thought so. It's it's hot syrup weekend. I'm gonna go and um, and find one of these sugar shacks to try this year's maple syrup out and maybe buy some. So I looked at the map on their website and I I found three sugar shacks near my house. Well, not really near. I had to drive quite a distance to get to them. But it was a beautiful day. It started off like shit in the morning. It was pouring rain. So I figured, fuck, man, this is going to be just horrible to be uh, going out to these places. It'll be like muddy and gross. And But anyway, so it stopped raining eventually in the morning. And so I drove to one of these places. And it was called Grampy's, Grampy's Sugar Shack uh, in Chesterville, Ontario. And it was amazing. It's like this huge, like, forest, like no leaves because because it's the not spring yet. The winter's just ended, and this is all maple trees, like gi- this giant like forest and a little house tucked in there, and besides the house, a tiny little shack, like two stories tall, but a little bigger than a garden shed, pretty much, and two stories tall wooden uh, shack. And out of the roof of this shack, big like billow of steam was coming out and going up into the sky. And this little shack nestled in the maple trees was the sugar shack where Grampy was evaporating off all this maple sap from all the trees in his property. I think he said he, he um, tapped 600 trees. And all these trees... It was a little hole in each one of these trees and a plastic pipe going from that tree on an angle going down like so gravity would feed the sap out of the tree all the way down into his little sugar shack where he would then turn it into maple syrup. Now, when I was a kid, when I was a tiny kid in Montreal growing up, I remember going to one of these sugar shack things as a uh, maybe a school project. It was all very vague in my memory, right? So I arrived at this place, and my memories of that as a kid were like, it was rammed with hundreds of people, screaming children, all the things that that really might be nice for other people, but not me. So I was like, I had steeled myself for this. But when I arrived, I was the only person there. Because I think the weather was so bad in the morning that people just decided not to bother or whatever. You know, so anyway, and it was pretty early. But I I, I went and uh, parked and... And Grant, uh, 
Grammy sent me down to the sugar shack. So I walked down, opened the door, and inside this space was this, it was like a rectangular space, two stories in the inside, but there was this huge stainless steel rectangular like thing with trays in it, steaming, right? Just This was where all the steam was coming from. And in front of this was a, what looked like a wood stove built right under it. It was hot in there, and it, it smelt faintly of wood smoke and and steam, and, and uh, there was Grampy there. I mean, it, he, he looks sort of like his name, like you would picture, like a, a Santa, but thinner, you know, a thin Santa. And he was there hard at work ma- making maple making his maple syrup from his trees. And he explained to me, I asked him a whole bunch of questions, like uh, this is the perfect opportunity to ask him questions because nobody else is here. And I watched him and he was constantly busy doing shit. Like this guy was serious, man. He was like, he said, uh, I'll talk, but excuse me for a second while I do this. And, and he said, and he'd answer a question. He says, excuse me for a second while I do, I have to do this now. And he was doing this constantly, you know, adjusting little dials or like, um, knobs like filtering stuff or doing it was constantly engaged with the process of making his syrup and then he told me to stand back from this and from the front where the wood stove thing was and he opened the door and this blast of heat came out it was like holy shit you know i have a wood stove in my house that's how my house is heated but this was like a blast furnace and it was stacked you can imagine a two by three foot square rectangular space stacked like packed full of like burning roaring wood like it was crazy i had to step back like he was where he had to put on a special apron and shit while he loaded more wood into it like it was crazy this thing was burning like a like a blast furnace and then he closed the door he closed the door and then he took off the apron and he explained that you know you need to keep it this hot to evaporate the sap so he explained the process, how it's gravity fed down, and and he works with it, and he tests it, the sugar content. It has to be this, a certain sugar content. Everything it touches has to be stainless steel. Thus, the whole evaporator process was stainless steel. So he was explaining all this to me. He was, he was so well, knowledgeable. Of course he's knowledgeable because he had built this evaporator himself by, by hand. His, he said his father had had given him one of the trays from a smaller one or whatever, and he had built this huge thing himself over time. And uh, it was entirely custom built to make his amazing maple syrup. Now this strikes me as important because this this is a professional, this guy. He said he was retired and he sells maple syrup, I guess, but he's not a corporation. He's not one of these big companies He's a he's an individual working on his craft to the highest standards, right? Like he's completely dedicated. Just looking at this guy, you know he's focused on making the best product he can make. After this whole tour, he took me into he had another little shed where he where you know he had like almost a little storefront. It wasn't really a nothing fancy, just a shelf with his bottled syrup on it. If you ever wonder why real maple syrup is so expensive, this is this is why, because it's made in this manner, the old fashioned way. And anyway, I bought a two liter bottle and um, and left. And I, I've been thinking about the act of this guy making maple syrup today, this morning, like when I woke up, I'm, I'm still thinking about this, this whole thing. This guy, he, he's a professional, but he's, he's retired, um, but he has a, a business selling maple syrup. He is entirely focused on making the best product he can make at at at, at any moment. You know, just watching him work, and and I realize this is like how I work with my jewelry pieces. I work like this too, right? I like, I'm always focused on on the super high end of quality. I'm not a huge corporation. Um, we're a small team of of super talented goldsmiths in Toronto and we're on in the Thousand Islands area it's like you don't have to be a huge company 
to to make amazing products. And and in fact, like a huge company couldn't make products like this. They can't. They can't do it, right? But with cannabis in the cannabis sector, there are, there are people who uh, make extracts. This is maple syrup is like an extract, right, from the maple tree, and it's refined and in an old fashioned method, and and um, and that's the best, the, the absolute best maple syrup is made that way. And well, anyway, before I move on to the cannabis part. The the um, if you're ever up in Ontario, in the eastern part of Ontario, or in the western part of Quebec, also, this is ground zero for maple syrup. Hunt out, hunt out a sugar shack in this this time of year, sort of March, April, when the weather gets warmer, it stops. Right, the trees need this fluctuation between freezing and thawing in order to pump the pump out the maple syrup. They, as Grampy explained to me, he said these these cycles, it's like a pump. The tree becomes a pump and pumps out the sap, the freeze-thaw cycles. He said in February we had a freeze-thaw cycle, and uh, he tapped a tree, and it was actually, they managed to get a little bit of sap out in, in February too. But now's the time. So if you're ever up in Canada, in um, in eastern Ontario, or or western Quebec, you have to try the maple syrup and you have to go if not to Grampy's to one of the other many sugar shacks in the area to, to check it out but now back to cannabis there there are people who make extracts from cannabis that put that much effort into it to to make it the best they can make it are professionals at what they do or the winemaker right like the winemaker somebody who grows the grapes and crushes them and ferments them bottles them it's a craft, but it, there's chemistry and there's all kinds of other stuff involved in that too. But it's a, it's a, it's a product that has character. Yeah, it takes humans to produce, and it takes all things can a lot of things can go wrong in the process of making it. And this is why uh, you, different years uh, yield different products, right? But I guess maple syrup is like that as well, and other things too. So anyway, this morning I've been thinking a lot about the maple, the sugaring off thing, and how it applies to jewelry, and um, and me in particular. Um, I think if you're serious about what you do, like I'm 100% serious about what I do, even now, talking to you, I'm committed to it, 100%. And when I make jewelry pieces for Tribe, when we design pieces, we're like the maple syrup maker. It's It's like... 100% focused. Excuse me, I've got to do this. Uh, hold on a second while I do this because it's important and it has to be done in order to get the product out perfectly and the right way. I'm, I, I've am i got two liters of maple syrup already. I've still got a little bit in the fridge from another another local maple syrup place called Golden, I think it's Golden Moments. This was at the other place I could have gone to, but it was like, this is a place they they it's, they make their own maple syrup, but they also breed uh, golden retrievers. So just the thought of going to this place and getting swarmed by golden retriever puppies and having all that maple syrup nearby, like I knew it wouldn't have ended well for me. I would have like, I would have come back with like four puppies and, and, uh, 10 gallons of syrup or whatever. So I chose not to go to that one <laughs> and instead went to uh, went to Grampy's. But I, any or all are worth going. So make the trip. Also, you Americans, uh, like I say, upstate, or n near the Canadian border, you get pretty good um, maple syrup as well and sugar shocks too. So check it out if you can. This, this week I'm working on stuff, uh, different things. I'm finishing off a pendant Another huge hip hop pendant. It's made from two cannabis leaves cast in sterling silver. One is an indica leaf, a fatter one that hangs, and then the bale is made from a second leaf and a sativa leaf that's folded over to form the bale. And they're both joined together. It's unusual, but it's cool. I like it. So I'm gonna just finish that up. It's done. I just have to. I just have to polish it a little bit and photograph it and put it up on our site or on the uh, on the Instagram page. 
Instagram, social media. I fucking hate it. I fucking hate it. It's like, I don't want to make reels. I don't want to, I don't want to get on that hamster wheel, Mark Zuckerberg's hamster wheel to sell my products. I don't want to do that. So thus I'm so slack on Instagram. I am so slack. I, I'll put stuff up when I think about it, right? I'm more concerned about making the products. I'm not concerned about being a good Mark Zuckerberg customer product or whatever you are when you're signed up to Instagram. I'm not on TikTok at all. I, I'm i really, I don't want to go there. First off, it's too young. It's not, these are not the, um, this is not the demographic for my products, for uh, products in precious metal. So I'm not going to set up an account with them. And uh, why even? Like, why bother? I'm too busy to be doing that shit. So if you want our stuff, you're going to have to come and send me an email, alexd at cannabisgoldsmith.com. And uh, send me an email and let's talk. But like, I don't want Mark Zuckerberg getting between me and you either or TikTok getting between me and you. Approach us directly, we'll make amazing products for you. But, you know, I often see artists get mired in this shit. It's a trap, it's a trap. You you get, you find all your creative juices being sucked away by Instagram or uh, Facebook or, or uh, and these kind of things. I, I, what I'm using Facebook now for is a notepad. I'm using it as Pinterest, basically. I don't, I don't, I'm not on Pinterest either, but, and Tribe isn't on Pinterest. If I'm using Facebook like Pinterest, I, I basically, if, if I see a picture I like or whatever, I'll post it on Facebook. And then, then I, that way I can use their search engine to, to find it again if I want a reminder what it looked like, right? Or I'll post notes of the day, what I'm doing today. So today I'm making this pendant, I'll post that on Facebook. And that way I can time it, track it and see when I was doing it, right? Because frankly, um, I don't want to write it down. Um, I want to separate that from what I do writing down. As an artist, I, I tend to draw and stuff. So I want to keep the pens separate from this kind of accounting shit, right? Dates and numbers. And that's how I work anyway. So, yeah. So, that, um, so the idea that... Um, social media is going to do something for you that somehow you'll get magical virality on your 40 million people will see your your jewelry piece or whatever that's um not going to happen and the the idea that it might is what keeps people posting on on these platforms but it's not going to happen it's like winning a lottery right and Frankly, I don't want to be gamified like that. I don't want to be in a game loop like that. I want to make products. I want to design the finest products in the world out of live cannabis plants. I want to do crazy themed jewelry uh, collections for DJs, you know, collections for cannabis people. You know, I want to make the just, the, just take jewelry where it's supposed to be into the future. Like, come on, like we've had the 1800s for long enough. Let's, or Art Deco even, my favorite period. It's my favorite, I love Art Deco, but let's, let's move into the future, fuck. You know, we've been through world wars, pandemics. You know, let's, let's let the art loose because it's going to save us from all the other shit. So I'm, I'm working really hard on making the best products I can make for people to wear out of cannabis, like wear the plant, like taking the organic feeling and putting it into metal, like transmuting it into precious metal. So that's what I'm doing. Um, now, so that means I don't have a lot of time for social media. I'm on Twitter though. I love, um, this is the, uh, the addiction that I have and Twitter is basically destroyed now, but a lot of people I know uh, have Twitter accounts, and that's how I uh, see their stuff, right? And that's how I see what they're up to, and that's how I can I can ping out to them if I if I you know say okay no or, or yes or you know I agree or whatever. I'll 
I'll ping back to them. I, I That's how I look at Twitter, and I've always looked at it like that. I never read anything anyone replies. If somebody replies to something I've said, I never even look at it. I have no idea what anyone has said about what I've said on Twitter. I have z- zero idea. And that's how I've always used it. It's not meant to be used like that, I guess. I mean, still, I find it addictive. Like, But it's not good for an artist to be defocused on politics on making Mark Zuckerberg richer, on any of these other any of these other things that are opposite to the core mission of creating art and, and product design. So I'm I've eliminated a lot in my life in order to do this now. A lot. So any defocusing from the mission is is like not good. But as an artist uh, we need to survive, right, as a creative person. So you need to, people to see your work. Otherwise, you can't. So it's a kind of a dilemma, really. So anyway, I'm trying every way I know how to get word out about our products. I'm talking about them. People discover them. People tell their friends about them. So, you know, this is all I want. I don't want to be a, a huge corporation. This is nothing that interests me whatsoever. It doesn't. The goal with Tribe is to make the best, the very best products in precious metal. For anyone who who wants amazing quality jewelry made from cannabis plants or inspired by cannabis plants, you know, designing jewelry for different communities of people. So this week I'm working on this leaf. It's almost done. That'll be up for sale soon. I'll put pictures of it up on Instagram if you want it. Now, let me tell you, we're a custom jeweler, so we don't carry stock. We have no stock. So there's nothing, there's no store, there's not none of that. So if you want something, we make it for you. That's how it works. If you see something that on our site that you like or you have an idea, you know, we'll, we'll collaborate and come together with something that, that's like crazy. Um, so give me an email and let's let's make amazing amazing products. It's really labor intensive to make maple syrup in this old fashioned traditional way. And this is why it costs so much. When you go to the store and you see a bottle of Ontario or Quebec maple syrup or a tin of it, and it costs so much money and you go, oh, you know, I'll take this other cheaper brand or whatever. That's next to it. That is likely not even maple syrup or maybe just a tiny taste and the rest sugar water or whatever. Who knows what it is? But with the real maple syrup, all that labor and love and chopping of firewood and, and, and you know, constant monitoring and adjusting and, and to come out with a product that's amazing. This is why it costs more. And this is why quality costs more. Now, some companies, corporations are trying to harness the image of this in order to make their products appear like that much work went into them, into their creation. But if any product is mass produced, it wasn't made like that. Maybe the first one was made like that, but the 10 million after it weren't. So to the folks who were trying to charge as much as they can, good for them. But a product that is made in a traditional manner, like maple syrup, like Grampy makes, is different than a mass bottling operation. You know, it's two different things completely. So when you're when you're thinking about price and when you're about to buy something that's that's made, think about it, you know? Think about what element of the product is actually, how much you're paying for what? Like, are you paying for the marketing, for the brand, the name? How much of the, how much of the price is going to the name and how much of it's going to the actual product, what actually went into the product? How much of it, it is like poured in with love and how much is, is painted on after? These are the questions you have to ask yourself. But if you go to a maple syrup, if 
you go to a uh, sugar shack, an authentic sugar shack, and you watch a master craftsman make maple syrup, you'll understand that there is a difference between quality and ordinary stuff. And then you have to decide, is it worth spending the extra money for the quality or not? I mean, some people are perfectly fine, are perfectly happy not buying traditionally made maple syrup from Ontario or Quebec or upstate New York or, you know, stuff that's made in the traditional manner. And some people are just are comfortable not even worry, not even worrying about that stuff. But other people seek it out. So with Tribe, with us, people seek us out. They look for us. Send me an email and say, oh, yeah, yeah, somebody said you make this, right? And I mean, just reach out and let's talk. We can make an amazing product for you in the old traditional manner. So what is quality really? I mean, if something is made by a master craftsman in a traditional, using traditional tools and techniques, that have been passed down for generations and makes a product, whether it be wine or jewelry, high jewelry, cigars, um, cheese, maple syrup, marble flooring. I mean, yeah, I can think of a million things where a master craftsman could imbue quality into a material into a, a type of material and whether it's tree sap or metal you know or tobacco leaves rolled into a cigar I'm not a tobacco person but I do understand that the, that there's an art to that um, again a similar product to cannabis or or maple syrup but what is quality A lot of people don't even, I mean, we've been so, we've been so saturated with mass produced products that many people don't know what quality is or have never seen it before. I mean, seeing it in a picture, you have to experience it with most of your senses. This is why when you're confronted with, say, for example, if you're, uh, if you're eating dinner at some fancy restaurant. And immediately the cutlery you're using feels different, the knives and the forks. The, you, you immediately notice it because they feel different than what you might be using at home or, or something. And you look at them and you, you, you get a sense that there, there's something about them that makes them better. Maybe they're made of silver. Maybe they have hallmarks on them. Maybe they've been, you know, around for a long time. Or maybe they're modern made, but made with the, the, the highest quality materials. These things a, a person notices when they, when they buy something that has quality. It's a hard word to describe. People want to say their stuff has quality. But in the way I think about quality, it has to quality is poured into a product. It has to go into a product. And, and this comes from the, the product designer, the person who makes the product. The feeling of these people that the and the skills has to go into making it. And that's where the quality comes from. Now granted there's as I said earlier there are companies that want to harness the whole just the idea simply the idea of this um, you know they say oh uh, there's a picture of an old cabin or something on the label right this the idea here is to get you uh, in your mind to get your mind thinking kind of internally comparing you know the old fashioned manner of production with a uh, with what's in the bottle but for the most part, in mass production, that's just a, a label on the outside. That's paint on the outside. What's on the inside is, is, is different from what's suggested by that little cabin on the outside. So you know all this stuff. I'm not telling you anything new here. But just consider it. When you, the, best, the best way to, to hunt quality is to go into the past. 
Be a time traveler. This spring, go into the past. Uh, there'll be all kinds of uh, garage sales and flea markets and stuff in your neighborhood. Go in to explore and look at stuff. Just look at objects. Go in. Don't buy anything. You don't have to buy anything. But just this is another exercise. Go out and look at stuff. Like if somebody, you 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 can tell quality, can't you? I mean, if you if if somebody's got a bunch of chairs on their lawn made of wood, and there there's ones that look great at a distance, but as soon as you go and pick them up, they 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 just feel like nothing. They feel weird, right? And then there might be one next to it that's is similar looking but the wood's heavier if you look closer it's it's well it, it's been worked and ma manufactured by somebody who sort of knew what they were doing right you know, you you know all this stuff you just have to apply it to smaller objects for jewelry yeah but let me throw another one at you ideas have quality too the idea itself might have a a higher level of quality than another idea I mean, I like to think our jewelry is a great idea, making precious metal jewelry from cannabis plants. But other, other people might think that's an idiotic idea. That's insane. That's nutty. Like, why, right? And this is why it's so hard to mass produce quality. You can't do it. You just can't. Because even if you can get the physical object to look like the original object made by the designer, it's not that object. It's something else that is completely different. And not only that, there are so many of them, like widgets, whatever it is, jewelry, cars, there are, there are clones of it everywhere. So whatever quality it had is lost or diluted the more it's reproduced it's it's i call this alex d's law of quality the more you reproduce an object the more diffused its quality becomes so it becomes less of a quality object the more the more of them that are around well, you know this. That's mass production, right? I love quality. I could go on about quality forever, but I got to get back into the workshop and make products, do some polishing and take some pictures. I'm going to upload a whole bunch of photographs to the website. We're doing some website redesign slowly at tribe.ca and putting up new pictures adding a bit of new content, but taking down a lot of content too. So I'm going to streamline a lot of stuff on the website. Anyway, the website just exists as a place where you can come and look at our quality and explore and see what we've made before for other people, for other clients in our studios in Toronto and Thousand Islands, Ontario. So visit tribe.ca when you get a chance. The Cannabis Goldsmith is produced by Tribe Communications, Inc. in the Thousand Islands area of Ontario, Canada. Tribe is a registered trademark used under license. Visit our website at tribe.ca. Send me an email, alexd at cannabisgoldsmith.com. Next week, we're going to be talking about charms, charm bracelets, Next week, we're going to be talking about charm bracelets. So tune in next Wednesday for the Cannabis Goldsmith.